for those who are with us for the first time or even uh, joining us after a few weeks, we're in the middle of a, a series in a way of just two parts. Uh, about three weeks ago, I think I did part A of uh, seven things that God hates. And this morning, we're going to finish it up by part B. Uh, but let me uh, just uh, recap for those who have missed this or for those who are watching for the first time. Uh, basically, we talk about the fact that God is loving and compassionate and he's holy and he's perfect and he's pure. And uh, that's a, a sense that we always talk about the loving aspect of God. But there's an aspect of God where he actually hates certain things. He hates sin. And uh, it's got the, as much as he's, he's a loving God, he's also a God who detests sin uh, and hates it. Uh, he created us to be in perfect relationship with him. And then sin entered the earth and brought division between God and mankind. And he hates that. He hates the fact that sin brings that division. And anything that is going to damage us or hurt us or bring us separation from the God, the Father, he hates that. And this hatred of sin is what caused him to send his son Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again as we've just celebrated around communion, reminding ourselves that God is for us and not against us. So although we all talk about the love of God today, we're actually going to be talking about the things that God hates. And uh, obviously these are some things that we've been touching on the last few weeks. So let's pray and then we'll uh, recap quickly and then let's hit the rest of the ones that we've missed out on. So let's pray. Well, Father God, again, we thank you for your word, that it is alive, it's active, it's useful to teach us and correct us. And uh, Lord, we pray this morning as we look at these uh, things that you hate, that Lord God, that we all would learn from that and father god would take that on our own in our own journey lord would you speak to us and minister to us i pray in jesus name amen well as i said uh, on the the first uh, part of this is that uh, a lot of the things that we see in this proverbs passage are basically summed up in the sermon on the mount or in the ten commandments so basically they're just an expansion of a lot of that so let's quickly touch base the first one we looked at was uh, the arrogant eyes or, 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 or haughty eyes. And uh, this describes this feeling of arrogance um, and pride and looking down on one another. Basically, I'm better than you. I'm a better person than you. Uh, this sense of arrogance. And, and it says that God hates that. He hates the fact that there's this sense of arrogant, arrogance. And in, in Proverbs uh, 16, just a few more chapters down from Proverbs 6, we read, first pride, then crash, the bigger ego, the heart of the fall. It's better to live humbly among the poor than to live it up among the rich and famous. There's this sense that God hates the pride. And just about every time we read about pride and arrogance in the Bible, it's associated with failure, not success. Uh, it's important to note that. So arrogant eyes, that's the first one. The second one we looked at, and if, for those who are too fast at the moment, you'll have to go online and listen to the first part of this message. Uh, the second one was the fact that God hates a lying tongue. Now, I said last time we actually all get this one. Uh, that God hates a lying tongue. The fact is, a default setting in our humanity is the sense of lying, to cover up, to, to do whatever it takes to defend ourselves. And often, even as kids, we talk about the fact that kids, their first response is sometimes lying rather than telling the truth. It's, it's something that's built in. And God hates the lying tongue. In the book of John, we talk about the fact that Satan is the father of lies. We read this. He is a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. And that's partly why God hates the lying tongue, because not only is the devil the father of lies, but he knows how much damage the lying tongue can do. The third thing that was the hands that kill the innocent. And again, we get this one. You know, the sixth commandment actually says you must not murder. And we talked about it a few weeks back that, that Jesus pushes it even further in Matthew. And he says, you're familiar with the commands to the ancients. Do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. There's a sense that even in our anger, we can actually display that sense of wanting to take someone out. And God's going, this is not right. It's not right. God hates the hands that kill um, an innocent person. The fourth one we looked at was a heart that plots evil. And God hates it when we think or imagine about things that, that are evil. And uh, the challenging thing about this one, it's not actually just doing the evil act. It's actually thinking about it. You know, most of us here as, as good Christians probably won't do the evil, evil, evil act. But dare I say, a lot of us have thought it. 
A lot of us think it. And what God is saying is the heart that plots evil, it's what happens within our heart that the problem begins. We actually read in Scripture in Hebrews, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before his eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God knows everything. He even knows what's in our heart and he hates it when we have uh, things in our hearts that are plotting evil or plotting the demise of someone else. Um, we know that, that it's always about the heart. God is always looking at the heart of the human being and wanting us to give everything to him, to love God with our heart, mind and soul, to know that in the heart there's both good but there's also a default of evil. So these are the, the four things the, the four things that we've looked at, the arrogant eyes, the lying tongue, the hands that kill the innocent and a heart that plots evil. So let's now look at the last few. And uh, for those who uh, are visiting or first time, you've just got a, 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 I think it was about a 30-minute message in a couple of minutes. So now we're going to keep going. All right. So the fifth one is the feet that race to do evil. Not only does God hate the fact that those who plot evil, but he hates the fact of people who actually race into doing evil. Uh, these are the people who not only rush into evil, but they sort of have no problem with doing evil or even sinning. It's like that there's no sense of worrying about what they do. They don't care what they do. And I want to be careful to say that this, this part of, of the feet that race into evil, it's not for those who accidentally fall into evil. As we know in our life, we can actually be tempted and we can... Um, it's not talking about that. It's talking about the deliberate thing of actually racing into evil. Those who are active or maybe it might be better to say who have a desire or an eager to do evil and usually for what they can get out of it. The issue, issue with this one is there's very little consequence thought of the, the, con, little, little we thought of the consequences or impact that the actions may have on another person. They often will think just of themselves and just do what they want without thinking the consequences that may be. You know, Proverbs warns us against those who want to lead us into running in this sort of way. If we have a look in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10, it says, My child, if sinners entice you to turn your back on them, they may say, come and join us. Let's hide and kill someone just for fun. Let's ambush the innocent. Let's swallow them alive like the grave. Let's swallow them whole like those who go down the pit of death. Think of the great things we can get. We can fill our houses with all kinds of stuff and take that we take. Come, throw your lot with us. We all share the loot. Verse 15, my child, don't go along with them. Stay far away from their paths. They rush to commit evil deeds. They hurry to commit murder. The proverb's clear and don't rush into doing evil things. Now, the problem is, Evil is a bit of a default setting within us. We, we have a sin that just, just, it's like gravity. You know, gravity just pulls us down. You know, sin can pull us down so easy. Even when we don't want to sin, we sometimes fall. And we've got to be careful. The psalmist reminds us that I have refused to walk on an evil path so that I may remain obedient to your word. The New Living Translation says this. It says, mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. The Bible consist, consistently tells us not to go down the path of evil. We need to humble ourselves before God and resist the devil and knowing that he will flee. James actually says this. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. This is a promise. That if we choose to resist the devil, resist evil, and we actually choose to flee from it and we draw near to God, the promise is that God will come near to us. It's like light and dark. I've said this many a times that, that God is holy and pure and can't be in that sense of sin. So he can't be in this sense of darkness. As soon as you walk into a dark room and turn a light on, the darkness disappears. Darkness and light can't be in the same place together. And we need to actually rid ourselves of the darkness and allow the light of Christ to shine within our life. As we come closer to God, he will come closer to us. The truth is, as followers of Jesus, we are aware of the evil that's around us, the temptations that are around us every single day, but we need to choose not to run into it. 
to stay away from it, to turn our backs from it, to repent from it. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us a desire that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out the good intentions. There's this truth to that. And again, we read in Romans, when he died, this is talking about Jesus, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. You also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give, give in to the sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirement of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. We're to seek God first of all, our heart, mind and soul, and to focus upon him and not allow ourselves to race into evil or to focus on evil. See, God hates it when we do that, when we actually go down the evil path rather than to follow him. So God hates the feet that race to do evil. The sixth one is God hates a false witness who pours out lies. This is very similar to the second one that we looked at, which is God hates the lying tongue. Uh, so we've already looked at that one. But this is a little bit different because although God hates the lying tongue, which we all get, this one goes a little bit further because it's not about just the tongue. This is actually about telling lies, particularly about someone else, being a false witness, saying something that is not right about another person. It's okay to lie about yourself, apparently. No, it's not. But it's not even right to lie about others. And I think someone's phone's going off. You might want to uh, turn the alarm off. Um, a false witness is a, is, is a person who basically stands up before others and says something that's not true. So they're basically saying something that's true. And often it's with the intention of hurting someone or getting someone else in trouble or ruining their reputation to cover for yourself. The ninth commandment clearly says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. The message translation says, no lies about your neighbour. There's something about telling lies and mistruths about others God hates. You know, we all know that when you go to a court, um, and I know it's all changing these days, but the, the whole thing about standing there and saying, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. There's a sense that even in the court, we know that giving a false testimony is a criminal offence. It doesn't take rocket science to know that giving a false testimony is destructive and something that we should not be doing. And not only does it go against the greatest commandment of loving your neighbour as yourself, it actually goes against everything that God stands for. The truth is God knows that we all have to lie and to tell mistruths. And this is that sin default that we have, and that's why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus and put off this sort of falsehood. You now, it's interesting that even when Jesus was questioned about different foods and the way the disciples were carrying on and not hand-washing in certain things, Jesus actually made a comment about being truthful. He says this in Matthew 15, and this is around the issue of, of ceremonial washing. He says, don't you see that whatever enters your mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what makes a man unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Although this is focusing around the ceremony of washing, it's really interesting that Jesus makes the connection between what comes in the evil, the, the heart, the, the heart's evil desires, and, and false testimony is part of that. I actually love the message translation. It says, but what comes out of the mouth gets its start in the heart. You know, what we're thinking about, what we're dwelling about, that's the stuff that's going to come out eventually. 
And if we're not walking in relationship with Jesus, then our focus is on self rather than God. And that's when we can easily fall in the trap of not only lying, but being a false witness and pouring all sorts of kinds to make others, or particularly yourself, look good. I don't want to get caught up on gossip, but there's a whole bunch of stuff we can talk about that. Have you heard? And often can I say that gossip is testimony. Because often gossip is third, fourth, fifth time you're hearing it and this gossip starts from here and then it goes to there and suddenly it's got nothing to do with the truth at all. God hates a false witness. You know, Paul also speaks about this in Ephesians when he says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of the one body. Again, I love the New Living Translation. It says, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbour the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. So even as followers of Jesus, we're, we're not meant to be telling lies and telling false truths. And can I say that especially in the church, it's not meant to happen. Because not only are we breaking God's rules, but we actually are hurting the body of Christ, which ultimately means we're hurting ourselves. God hates it when someone tells a lie or gives false witness. I know the truth is, though, it's hard for us always to speak truth sometimes. When the pressure's on, that's where we fall into that temptation sometimes. Because we actually go to our old default setting rather than the default of what Jesus has done for us. You know, 2 Corinthians says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, a new creation, the old is gone and the new has come. In other words, put away the false stuff, put away the evil stuff and allow ourselves to live the new life that God has given us. That when we feel lead to go temptation, we have to put the focus on Jesus, not on self. To realize that we've been created new because of what Jesus has done for us. Paul even speaks about this more in Colossians when he says, don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on a new sinful, put on your new nature and you'll be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. This is a key, folks. I love the message again and I want to read it again. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator. With, its la- with his label on it, all the old fashions are now obsolete. If you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, then you are a new creation in Christ Jesus and you've got a new way to live your life. And as Christ followers, we're not meant to be lying and being uh, telling mistruths. You know, Proverbs says in 12, again, it says, The Lord detests the lying lips but delights in men who are truthful. And again, I love it. I can't, God can't stomach lies. He loves the company of those who keep their word. God, folks, God hates a false witness who pours out lies. This is part of the seven things that he hates is that sense of lying and false witness. Number seven, the final one. And this is probably the, the most challenging ones, particularly for us as a church. Am I prepared to do this? This is the question. God hates a troublemaker in the family. Now, if there's any troublemakers amongst us now, it's okay, take a breath. But the truth is you don't know you're a troublemaker because the family are the ones that know you're the troublemaker, not you. <laughs> So God hates a troublemaker. Let's have a look at this. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 19, B, it says, A troublemaker in the family, a man who stirs up dissension among the brothers, uh, one who spreads strife among the brothers, a person who sows discord in the family, a person who stirs up conflict in the community, and the King King James, and he that soweth discord among brethren. (laughs) No matter what Bible translation we use, the message is pretty clear. God hates a troublemaker, particularly in the family. The word used here is the word brethren or brother or or meaning family member. And God hates a troublemaker within the family, the family of a physical family and, 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 and your own family, but also the family of God. God hates when people cause trouble in the family, especially here in the church. 
We see the importance of loving one another within the church and also outside the church as a common thread through the entire Bible. You can't not see that when you open the Word of God. Paul even says this. He says, But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other for God himself taught you to love one another. In other words, in Paul's eyes, it's like, I don't even need to touch this because this is just common sense and basic foundation teaching of a follower of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, by default, you love one another. You're not meant to cause trouble. Jesus himself gave a new command regarding this. And I want to suggest again, and and I've said this a number of times and I've spoken about this passage, this is not a recommendation, this is not a suggestion, this is not a good idea. This is a command. A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. You know, if the church actually really took this on, people in our community would look at us and say, I want what they've got. Because it says, by this, all men will know that we're disciples of Jesus. They'll know that there's something different about us. The problem is often in the church, and I'm talking generally, we're so busy fighting amongst each other that they're looking at us and going, I don't want any of that. But we are called to love one another. Now, we know sometimes it seems impossible today because we have so many differences of opinions. In fact, we could just mention a whole bunch of different topics this morning and we could have you fighting straight away because we have different opinions. Everyone in this room will have a different opinion. For instance, the Kangaroos is a fantastic football team. I know there's a couple of people that agree, but I reckon there's quite a few that you'd be strongly against me. But does that mean that we hate each other? No. It means we have a different of opinion. And I think this is a vital thing that we need to remember. Just because you don't agree or just because you don't think what they're saying is correct doesn't mean you hate the person. We are to love one another, even when they barrack for a different team. We are to love one another, even when what the person has just said really hurts and I feel like punching them in the face. Jesus says we're to turn the cheek, not to respond. You know, the biggest damage the church has done has been from within. When we cause trouble. Just imagine for a moment if there was no such thing as conflict in the church. This world would be transformed for Jesus, I can tell you that. There'd be nothing stopping the church. Remember Jesus in the first part of his message on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the sons of God. I love the Eugene Peterson's message again of this. He says, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place is in God's family. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the sons of God. God hates it, hates it when people take on the role of troublemaker, especially within the church. However, the flip side is he loves it when we're in unity together. How good and pleasant is it when brothers live together in unity? Again, the Bible speaks over and over again just how great it is when we actually live together in unity. In 1 John, we read this. If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is living in the darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates his fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Over and over again in John, 1 John chapter 4. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates his fellow believer, that is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he who has given us this command, those who love God must also love their fellow believer. Loving our fellow believers is what we've called to do. And again, in 
Ephesians, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behaviour. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. God hates the troublemaker in the family. God hates it when there's discord and, and arguments. And I want to just encourage us as a church here at Peel Street that, yes, we're going to disagree on things. That's okay. But can I plead? Can I strongly encourage? Can I command you? In the disagreement, don't bring hate and trouble and discord, but bring love. You know, one of the most powerful things we can do as followers of Jesus is say, hey, I don't agree with you, but I love you as a brother or sister. Hey, I don't agree with you, and and man, that just really gets me wild, but hey, I'm going to pray for you. And we can actually walk out agreeing to disagree rather than walk out trying to punch each other's lights out. What normally happens is I'll take my bat, you take my ball, and we go to different churches. That's what normally happens. And the problem is they take their bat and their ball to other churches. And it starts all over again. God hates a troublemaker in the family. So the seven things that God hates, the arrogant eyes, the lying tongue, the hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do evil, false witness who pours out lies and a troublemaker in the family. So the question today is, is what do we actually do with these? Because if God hates all these things, then we've also, as followers of Jesus, we have to hate these things as well. And the way we begin to hate them even more so is as we walk closer with Jesus, we begin to hate the things that Jesus hates and we love the things that Jesus loves. When we're walking in relationship with Jesus, we can't do things on our own. We have to do things that Jesus calls us to do. Because, again, it's not about what I want. It's about what God wants in and through me. The book of Romans, chapter 12, says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Again, I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it in the message when he says, Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be chained from the inside out, readily recognises what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Folks, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus and we have to be transforming the renewing and renewing our mind all the time to the things of God, not the default setting of our sin. The truth is, many of us are going to battle with these seven things within our lives. There's going to be times when we're going to be tempted to tell a lie. There's going to be times when we we might think we're better than someone else. I pray to God that there's not going to be times when we're going to take a life. But let's be honest, the question always gets put to you is, would you take a life? And we all go, no, no, no. But if someone's threatening you, My prayer is that as we reflect on these things, that we'll take the things that God hates and we'll actually flip them around to the opposite. Because if God hates these seven things, then I want to suggest that God actually loves the complete opposite. He loves the fact when the eyes are humble, when we humble ourselves before God. I want to suggest that he loves the fact when we speak truth, when the tongue that speaks truth. I want to suggest that he loves when the hands that fight for the innocent, fights for the innocent, that he loves a heart that plots goodness, that feet that race to do good, and an honest and peacemakers in the family. As I close this morning, I want to encourage us to all fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And to not only avoid the seven things that he hates, but let's approach these seven things that are the opposite 
and actually look at those and put those within our lives. Let me pray. Father God, again, I want to thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, as we've just looked at this Proverbs chapter 6 and, and looking at the things that you had, I pray for all of us that, Lord, that we would actually take this and look at the things in a complete opposite way and strive to do the things that you love. Father God, if there's anyone here this morning who can identify to some of these areas, I pray that you would not only hold us account, but, Father God, that you would remind us that you love us and you're for us. And that, Lord, as we repent of our sin, you forgive us. I want to pray protection over our family here at Peel Street. That, Lord, that we would be a church that, that live out the gospel and that would not allow the enemy to bring division or to cause problems. And, Lord, when things arise, that we'd be able to speak truth in love. So, Father God, I just pray a blessing upon all of us this morning that we'd all know your presence in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.